Um, and we're also starting to talk about return of function, not just slowing down the illness, but can we actually stop this illness and we can we help people regain function? And those are words never used before in ALS. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Today on our podcast, we're thrilled to welcome Merit Sukovich, a superstar in the world of neurology. As a Harvard neurologist and ALS trailblazer, Merritt combines brains and heart to tackle one of medicine's toughest challenges. From MIT to leading the master platform ALS clinical trials at Massachusetts General Hospital, her journey is as fascinating as it is impactful. Get ready for an insightful chat with a real life neuroscience hero. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Hey, Merritt, great to see you. How are you doing? It's great to see you too, Tim. I'm doing really well, having a nice holiday with the, with the family at home. Merritt, can you please tell us a little bit about who you are for the people watching who don't know? Sure. So I'm, um, I'm a neurologist. I take care of people who have uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. I work at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. I'm a chair of the Department of Neurology there. Um, but I spend um, most of my time really uh, taking care of people with ALS and trying to uh, develop new treatments and speed up the process so that we can really find some cures for this illness. That's awesome. And, and can you talk about a little bit your background of how you got into neurology and how you, tra- you I see you went undergrad to MIT for engineering and then you ended up in the uh, Harvard Medical School and doing neurology and ALS specifically. How did that come to be? Yeah, well, in my high school yearbook from uh, Buffalo, New York, I actually wrote that I wanted to be a neurologist, but then oh, I kind funny. of got sidetracked at um, MIT. It was one of the um, the energy crisis of the eighties, and I thought maybe I should be an engineer and try to develop better fuels. But um, I kept getting drawn into like biology and and um, and medicine, so I. I went to a um, Harvard MIT joint program for engineers who want to do medicine, and I really fell in love with the brain there. Um, and um, I still thought I would do research until until I started to see patients. And once I started seeing patients as a medical student, I just knew that that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to take care of people and also try to develop you know, new new treatments and and try to improve their lives. When you were growing up, both of your parents were immunologists. Is that why you decided to become a doctor? If not, what was it? I think so. You know, my father was an immunologist um, and my mom um, initially uh, was at home with us. But then, um, you know, when he passed away, she went back to work in in the lab of a a colleague of his. But we were always surrounded by science. Um, His students would come to the home. I I remember them sitting around the, the table with him. And that was before computers where, you know, he'd be rewriting their papers and teaching them how to write and how to think about science. And it was just this love that I could see from him and, and other, um, you know, his students. And, uh, you know, it, it just seemed like uh, a career that, that had a lot of personal, you know, fulfillment, but also, um, you know, something that you could give back to others. Um, so uh, I have to say that, that uh, we, though my parents loved classical music and, you know, they, they, Certainly, highly educated. We we were a science driven kind of family, and not not so much on the humanities, and definitely not on the sports. I'll tell you. <laughs> um, 
that my family did not want me to do any athleticism, (laughs) athletic activities. Yeah, that's something that you and I normally, I I try to do sports references to dumb down your your, uh, medical terms and you have to stretch to get there. How how old were you when your uh, when your father passed? It was a freshman in college. I was young, uh, nineteen. Did that play a big role on wanting to become a doctor? You think, or were you were going to be a doctor before? I guess you said in high school. It it definitely uh, made me want to go into to medicine. You again, I want. I was kind of gearing up for research in some way. But kind of, you know, seeing personally how physicians took care of him and seeing someone go through that, um, you know, also was part of why I wanted to also become a doctor. Yeah, that's really interesting. And when you were applying to colleges, I mean, MIT and Harvard are obviously uh, pretty, pretty prestigious schools academically. Um, you know, was that, was that your dream school, MIT, or how did you end up there? I'll tell you that I loved it, but I, I it was not my dream school. I'm sorry for any listeners from MIT. You know, I, uh, I'll just tell you here, and I guess this will be for the world, is the only school I got into was MIT. And I got in early um, admissions, and I was like, I don't know if I want to go there. Um, and, uh, but I loved it. It was, it was a phenomenal school. What did you get on your SAT? <laughs> Well, this is why I got into MIT. I got a perfect score on the on my math part of it. I got an 800. Wow. But my, my English was a little lacking. <laughs> I got like a 650. Um, and yeah. it's a big joke in our family because I married a mathematician and I who was from Russia. And I actually got a better score than him in math, but he beat me by a long shot in English, even though that was <laughs> his second language. Well, the good news for both of you is I can barely spell MIT, and I definitely didn't get a perfect uh, math score, so you guys got me beat. Yeah, I used to know a lot of math, I, uh, but I, I, it's kind of gotten a little rusty. Yeah, what did you get on your uh, SAT? You can, can you compete with those numbers? No, I can't. But I took the test with zero preparation and walked out of the test and down the hall to the locker room to change into my football uniform and play in a game. So I got a 700 on the math, but only a 530 on the English. But I'm also from Russia and English is my second language, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. as, a, right. as, the, uh, as the child's author, I guess adult novelist and uh, child, children's okay. author as well, I don't you, made, think, you made up for it. And now, Troy, it's your turn. I don't even know my exact score. When, <laughs> see, what you guys don't understand is the average person, we don't get a high enough score to remember it. We just are happy we got in. Once we get in, <laughs> once we get in the college, we don't remember where we were, what we got, where we were when we took it. If we had a game that day, we're just happy we got in the damn school. Yeah, black it out. <laughs> yeah. I, I got an 1,100 was my overall score, but... I did not have the test the same day and I was not trying to get into MIT or I'd not have a football game the same day. So I don't have that built in excuse and I was not getting into MIT. So Merritt, um, let's talk quickly just about, you know, how we met and how we crossed paths. So, uh, my father in, in 2016 was diagnosed with ALS. Um, the doctor that gave him the diagnosis, uh, basically, said, you know, you'll have about six months to live, get your affairs in order. And, um, you know, my, my dad's response to that initially was, you know, I didn't, he didn't want to hear the words ALS. We just acted like it wasn't there. And he kept on, cause at, at the time he got diagnosed, he was lifting weights and you know, looked like an action figure and, and all that stuff. There was no real noticeable signs other than he couldn't cut his nails with nail clippers. So anyways, fast forward, um, we, we kind of buried our heads in the sand and uh, pretended it wasn't there. And slowly more and more signs started showing. And then we had a mutual friend, um, Dr. Ryan Smart, who told us, uh, you know, we reached out to not just him, but a lot of other people. And your name came up um, from a lot of different, like I said, a lot of different sources, a lot of different places. Um, we reached out to, to uh, Dr. Smart. He said, as good of a doctor as Merritt is, she's that good of a person as well. And my mom and I kind of did a sneak attack on my dad. We got, we got him to uh, go out to, to meet you in, in, uh, at Harvard and in, in Mass General. And, you know, since then we've been in contact, whether it's 
stuff for, for ALS awareness, ALS fundraising, uh, my dad's, you know, stuff with my dad and the, and the progression of ALS. Um, and now really, you know, become friends. So I wanted to ask you, you know, what was your kind of first impression when you met my dad? And obviously you've been along with us for the ride here and seen kind of the, the ups and the downs. Well, first I want to say that, um, one of my crusades is to to try to educate neurologists and doctors not to say what they said to you. I mean, first of all, we we cannot make those predictions about people with ALS, as you as you're living proof that right. you know there the, there's a huge variation of how the course is with people, and and we should never be telling people to pack up their affairs and make you know because uh, that that's just the wrong message. This is really about trying to make this a livable illness and eventually curable one and a preventable one. Um, I, I remember meeting you up because you, you were, you know, striking in so many ways. I mean, uh, that, um, you know, I don't know too many people have had several careers and, and also that, you know, you came with this amazing family that was so supportive of you. Um, and I know that you, um, didn't particularly want to be there. <laughs> and I, I do want to ask you why <laughs> you uh, didn't want, uh, maybe it's because of that previous experience, but that we, it really became a partnership from that, that first day of how we were going to not only, you know, make sure that you got access to everything that that you could have the best quality of life, but that you, we could also solve this for other people. Um, You were very humble, as you know, as, as uh, people know, uh, I didn't actually know all your background and didn't know that you were a football player and, and in your other five careers from the beginning (laughs) Um, and I only discovered that later. And, and that's another thing about you that you're, you know, your humility, you know, you know, that you're, you're such an amazing person. So we, we connected on many levels at that first, first visit. How often do you become friends with patients? Well, not, not as many times as I'd like to, but I, I do think that in this field, it is really a partnership. And it's one of the things that's drawn me to being an ALS doctor is that it's, it's not about just, you know, our, the 15 minute visit. It's really a, a lifelong relationship with the person with the illness and their family. Um, but this is, this is extraordinary. The relationship I've had with you and your kids. I, I don't know many people's grandchildren as well as their children. Like I do with you. And I love that. One of the first times you and I met, it might've even been that first trip out to MGH. Um, you spoke about, you told me a story about, um, know why you were committed to the ALS field and not not why you got into it but there was a specific patient I think that you you worked with that turned this from a a a passion to a mission for you yeah um yes uh, Susan was really the first uh, person I took care of with ALS her and her two siblings had the genetic form of the illness uh you know which is which is uh the SOD1 which is only in two percent of people but um you know, they were all teachers. And so she taught me really about how to be a, a doctor, really, and how to care for people with this illness. And I'm, I'm still in touch with her son, who's now in his 30s, uh, and her uh, husband. Um, um, and it was exciting to call them on the day that, you know, the, the new treatment got approved for that form of ALS, um, which was just extraordinary. Yeah, no, that's, that must have been a, an amazing call. I mean, what a, what a journey. Vera, for the people, I mean, most people, I didn't know anything about ALS other than the Ice Bucket Challenge. And then when I watched um, a lot of Falcons, Atlanta Falcons versus Saints NFL games, I would see, um, they would mention Steve Gleason. So th- that was about the only you know, two slivers of, of ALS that I ever heard of until 2016 when my dad got diagnosed. What, how, would you, how would you explain uh, to somebody what ALS is and and somebody who got an 1100 on the SAT, not, not your two guys' SATs. <laughs> so ALS is in a group of illnesses we call neurodegenerative illnesses. And what that means, it's, it's an illness that happens more um, often as someone gets older. And there's a part of the brain that where the cells or the neurons, the nerve cells, start to get damaged. And in, in uh, people with ALS, uh, it's the motor neurons. And those are the, the nerve cells that control your movement and that really controls everything that we do, you know, from you know, moving your hands to your legs, to breathing, speaking, um, swallowing. Um, and it's, um, it's an illness that is, uh, 
um, only 10% of the time genetic and the other time it's what we call sporadic, uh, which means that it's probably uh, things in the environment that might cause it. Got it. Awesome. What is the pressure like to lose patients and friends every year to a disease you're trying to cure? It, it's, it, I'd say, first of all, it, it's awful because, you know, we, I get attached and our, our team gets attached to the, the people that we care for. And um, we do, we do remember them. We, we actually do, you know, we meet together to think, you know, at the end of the year about the people we've lost and the people we've also helped and what we can do more the next year. Um, I think the only way that I can do this every day is by um, merging the research, right? Trying to make a difference and trying to cure this illness and the relationships with people. They kind of keep us uh, together. I'll tell um, just a little anecdote. Once um, we asked the chaplain of, mass, of our hospital to come and, and talk to our patients in the clinic, we thought that would be a nice thing to offer. And the chaplain pulled me aside after a couple of Tuesdays in clinic and said, I do think your patients need my help, but I actually think you, you and your team need my help more. Um, I want to be there for you guys so that you can talk and um, process the emotions you guys are doing. And now, now we do that, you know, and that helps a lot. Talk to each other about what we're feeling and the losses that we're um, having. And that keeps, you know, in a way it helps us heal and helps us keep, keep going. Is that common amongst other hospitals or is that you think an MGH? It's not common. And we've, I've talked about it with other ALS centers, but I found that it helped our team, um, you know, our nurses and the therapists and the doctors um, heal and keep going. The other thing that keeps me going, I'll tell you that once I keep notes from my patients and their families and um, after the very first clinical trial that I ever ran, um, when we, when we shared the results, which for that, that one was didn't work. I, one of my patients called me and said, uh, thank you for trying. Anyhow, what's the next trial that I can sign up for? <laughs> and I thought, well, if she can't, isn't giving up, I can't give up. And that keeps me going because it's, it's a hard illness to solve, but I know we're going to solve it. We can't let the bumps in the road slow us down. We have to be resilient and we have to keep going. Um, and we have to keep going as faster so that we can really solve this illness. So speaking of the speed and, and trying to find a cure and all that, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing with the, the master platform trial and where the master platform trial originated from and how you kind of use that to, to impact ALS? Yeah, you know, I, I am really motivated by the, the seriousness of the illness and what I've heard from patients that time is not always on their side and so we have to move faster. So. We um we decided that that the field was in the in the state where we could move much faster on trials. So, for example, maybe five years ago, we might have one drug trial to test, one one idea to test. Now there's over 300 companies developing treatments for ALS, and so we decided that we would borrow this idea from cancer, where um, instead of testing one drug at a time, you develop the infrastructure, a platform to test many drugs at the same time. So you can, in the same time, get the answers to 10 treatments that you would have in the past one. So we started the first platform trial in ALS uh, in 2000, uh, sorry, in 2020. And uh, it's really fantastic. It's a very um, patient-centered approach. It cuts the time to developing treatments in half, cuts the cost by about a third. And it's it's really important for illnesses like ALS, where, where you want to shave off as much time in the process of getting um, therapies developed as possible. Yeah, that's amazing. Why don't you think all, you know, all illnesses have a master platform trial? Why is it oncology and ALS? I think you need to have an, enough knowledge of the illness to have a, like a, a big uh, pipeline of therapies to test, and then a platform trial makes absolute sense. So we're seeing this now in neurology. Um, you know, spring up for uh, platform trials in um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and stroke and traumatic brain injury. But it, it, it's only this last year or two because um, just the explosion of knowledge of what's causing these illnesses has led to you know, many more therapeutic ideas. But ALS was really the pioneer in leading the way for these platform trials in all, all brain science. 
Is there something that happened in the last couple of years? Like, was it a new technology or new test? Like, how, what what caused the rapid uh, spike in information? Yeah, it's a good question. I I think it was a combination of the science and then the ice bucket campaign. That 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 you know, people had good ideas about the science, but there there really wasn't that much funding. I mean, the government was funding you know some ALS science, but nowhere near what needed to be done. There were some small foundations that were doing the best they could, but all of a sudden there was this viral campaign that raised in the U.S. two hundred million dollars, and and that. There were all these ideas ready to be funded that, that, that those those money could go towards, and then it just kept you know, expanding. You know, there's more and more funds that are being raised for ALS, and so that draws in more scientists, more companies, and all of a sudden it's a hot field with a lot of new insights and new ideas. Um, so that's my theory on why it's changed so dramatically in the f- last five to ten years. Is there a lot of uh, support at the? College level, I know you know you're associated obviously with with Harvard University. Does does a Harvard and other schools like that do they do they get involved and in, and in, you know with financial resources and obviously with their uh, clinical teams they do, but do they get involved too with donating money? And uh, not not really. I mean, sometimes people ask me about the Harvard endowment, which I, of course I would love to have some resources from there, but that, that's really used for a different thing. That's used for you know obviously the the. You know, college tuition and the, you know, running, running the universities. I think where the, the universities come in is, is really attracting the top talent to work on things like ALS. And that for sure is happening at all the major universities. Um, I say now it's a, it's a hot time to be an ALS doctor. Uh, you know, I, I remember when I started my career in the nineties, I was actually told that there was no career in being an ALS doctor. And, and wow. fast forward now it's, it, there, it, it's a fantastic career. I mean, you can do a lot of good, and the science is so amazing that, you know, you know, for example, just last year we got two new drugs approved by the FDA. That's extraordinary, and I think hopefully twenty twenty four we'll have even more. Yeah, that's amazing. How did the ice bucket challenge come to be? The ice bucket challenge was started by two young uh, men who had ALS and who. Um, you know, started the, the, the online challenge and, and, you know, why this one took off and others, I, I don't really know other than, you know, I think maybe it's, it's you know, these two um, young people, one, you know, Peter Freides, who was an athlete, um, you know, they, they just had their connections. And I think uh, it changed, it changed our field. I think most people have never even heard of ALS or didn't really know what it was. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden there's, you know, presidents of countries dumping <laughs> ice on their heads, raising money for ALS. Um, and, you know, we still need a lot more. I mean, it's, it, it's hard to know how much money you need to solve an illness, but it's moved the field so much, so much forward. And, um, and there's just thousands of people studying this illness now. It, it, it's really, you know, it gives me a lot of hope that there's going to be big breakthroughs. Do you think you are close? And if so, why? I do think that we're close. And, and um, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, now we have, we have um, five FDA-approved drugs, four that slow down the illness and one that the symptom. Um, and a couple of years ago, you know, we had one. So there's been that much progress. And then, as I mentioned, we have all these companies that are now studying ALS. So there's, there's a lot of brain power uh, focused on this illness. Um, and we're also starting to talk about return of function, not just slowing down the illness, but can we actually stop this illness and we can we help people regain function? And those are words never used before in ALS. It's really just, you know, again, the last year. Um, and so, you know, I, I I think the more brains we have on this, the more funding we have, the faster the pace of discovery will be. Can you say anything? I don't know if you're allowed, what you're allowed to say and not allowed to say. Can you say anything about any repair and regenerative pro- uh, progress that's been made? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I can. Um, so, yeah, I'll just give two examples. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, that some people carry a gene that causes the illness. And now with the revolution in gene therapies, you know, we have two examples of where gene therapy um, not only stopped people from progressing, but also uh, people got better. Uh-huh. And, and uh, so that tells us it's possible. And you know, honestly, we didn't know it was possible before. 
uh, tells us that the motor neurons are not all gone, that they're still there. And that if you can stop the biology that's damaging them, people can um, get better. Um, and so, so um, you know, I've seen that, but other people have seen that. And what that does is it attracts scientists thinking about uh, repair for, for, um, for brain diseases into the ALS field. So, for example, people are studying this for spinal cord injury. So now they, they can also open up part of their lab to think about repair and ALS. Or people are thinking about it for stroke recovery. And now they can work on ALS, too. So it brings in people from different disciplines to think about ALS who have new ideas. And we know that, that that's always a good thing, to bring in people with, from other, other fields to think about your illness, because they'll have new ideas. Yeah, sure. That makes a ton of sense. Why, why do you think that, I mean, having repair and regeneration and people, you know, for the first time ever actually getting better, why do you think that wasn't more popular, more widely reported? Um, you know, why don't you think that was more household news than it was? I think, um, you know, and, and this is my field, so I can say it about neurologists, that we're, we tend not to be the most optimistic people sometimes, right? So we don't, I don't think it was in our vocabulary to think about people getting better with this illness. Same for like other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It's always been about thinking about, can we slow this down a little bit, give people more time? And now, you know, with younger people coming in the field and, you know, and, and more discoveries, the tune is changing. People are not satisfied with just slowing down the illness. They're about how do we use technology and new science to, to uh, return function for all these disorders. Does AI have a hand in any of this? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I do think AI is going to have a big hand in this um, um, because now we have, we have enormous data now on people with ALS, not, not just on clinical features, but also on their biology, on their motor neurons, what's going on in them. And it, it's too much data for the, the human mind <laughs> to put together, but bringing in um, computational scientists or, or AI experts into ALS, um, I think is going to help us um, get more what we call precision medicines, like targeted treatments for people, maybe be able to subtype people also um, on the repair end of um scanning science from other fields to kind of understand what might work in ALS. So you're, you're spot on. I mean, I think um, there's several universities, including our own, uh, that are trying to hire AI people for ALS uh, to, to try to bring them to, to the field. Do you think that the, the same kind of attitude and, and you know, potential outcomes are possible in the other neurodegenerative diseases? Do you think, you know, Parkinson's and, and dementia and stuff like that could see um, repair and regeneration in, in the near future? Yeah, I do. I absolutely do think so. And, and I, I think that the ways people are, are looking at it and those fields are things called neuromodulation, like where you can use maybe external, like um, it's called magnetic stimulation, or you can use sound therapy or light therapy to kind of uh, reset the brain or reset the networks. Um, people are looking at stem cells as a, as an approach in all these illnesses to um, create new again nerve connections. Um, people are using gene therapies even in the non genetic forms to kind of uh, uh, cause again new synapse or synapses or new connections between nerves. So the the ideas are that that are coming out are things that we would have thought was science fiction a couple of years ago, but are really coming to fruition in in all these illnesses. Um, so that's another important thing is that uh, to break down the barriers between these illnesses so that people know what each other are doing so that um, any advance in, let's say, Alzheimer's can then maybe lead to something in ALS and vice versa. Yeah, that's really exciting. I know uh, my, with my dad, we flew over a couple of times to, to South Korea to try some, some stem cell therapies, and that was um, you know, very, very interesting experience, but we were in the car riding from the airport to the, the hospital and the, the driver's English wasn't great, but we were pointing at things and asking what they were. And he was telling us, oh, that's the you know, famous market there. And that's it. And then we pointed over, what's over there? He goes, that's North Korea. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> the treatment in South Korea used stem cells from my bone marrow. Yes. Um, what, what you um, uh, received in, in South Korea uh, were your own stem cells. Yeah, from your own body. Merritt, I want to ask you some questions. Here are a couple of easy ones to warm up with. How did you meet your husband? Oh, 
that is an easy one. My um, my mom and his mom actually set us up. <laughs> so my mom went back to work uh, after my father passed away and met his mom. They were both uh, lab technicians at Roswell Park in Buffalo. And they schemed, even though it took them a long time to admit it, but they schemed to introduce us when I came home from medical school on a, on a break. So we met at, a, at, at his mom's house at a party. He was the only one under 40 there. So. <laughs> Where did he go to school? He went to Cornell undergrad and then NYU for his uh, math PhD. There's another good SAT score there. <laughs> Tell me about your kids. I have a pretty amazing kids. Uh, I have two, Alex uh, and Tali. Alex is 27 now. It's hard to believe. And Tali's 25. Um, they're really, they're wonderful people. Um, and uh, they're both still in grad in school. So my son is getting a, a PhD in biomedical engineering, and he's studying how to get gene therapies in the brain. And um, and I, so they're a little bit of, of a neural influence there. And then my daughter is at, at Northwestern and in medical school, and she's still deciding what she wants to do, but she, she does like neuro. So my husband's saying, what happened? How are they all going into neuro and not now? <laughs> what has been your biggest setback? That's a good question. Um, I think the biggest setback in our field um, is that we don't have things called biomarkers. So that we, when we look at somebody with ALS, like you or, or other people, um, we can't tell if the biology going on in your body is same or different than the biology in somebody else. And that me makes it hard to do targeted precision medicine. Like uh, an example is like now, like let's say breast cancer, they can take a tissue and they know the genes in there and they can give, you know, this group of women, this drug and another group of women, another, and they get much better success by having more kind of precision medicine. That's our biggest, I think, challenge and setback in ALS is that we don't have that yet. I think the day we solve that, um, th th this illness will be cured. You know, that, 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 that's our biggest barrier. And that's, I know you mentioned AI before. I think that's where AI can, can maybe come in and help us um, kind of what we call subtype people better so that we can be more precise in our treatments. Is it just a numbers game or is it a technology where to get those, those markers? I think it's both. I think the the numbers, um, because it's a relatively rare illness, um, um, you, you need large numbers of, of people and samples to to do this. But I, I do think because the kind of the global field of ALS is working well together, we're getting those numbers. So now it's bringing the the, the computation part, the AI part, to to those big data sets. Is there going to be like? Do we have the the ability to use old data, or is it? Was the science of the, in the uh, sorry? Is the science with the disease so new that old data is almost not relevant? It's a good question. I think a little bit of both. I think that that the, the, the old data is is definitely usable, and there are initiatives going underway now, funded by the U.S. government to to amass all that data together in a way that can be accessible to to you know to other scientists. But we probably need to still keep collecting data and, and um, especially with neurotechnologies coming out. So a little bit of both. What has been your own personal biggest setback? I think in, in, in my, in work, it's, it's really when the therapies don't work. Um, you know, I, 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 I do, I run a lot of trials and I, I, you know, I used to say sadly that I, I had the record for the number, most negative clinical trials. And that has always been a huge setback because it's, you know, people with the illness dedicating their lives to be part of those trials. And then when the drug doesn't work, it's, it's hugely disappointing. Um, but again, I've, I've kind of seen that shift in the last couple of years where we we've had some positive results you know we've had drugs go to market um and um that's why i remember that patient i mentioned who said don't give up and i keep going on even even with some of those like setbacks on, on the research and it's part of research i i do firmly believe that you get success by learning from the things that didn't work readjusting and trying you know trying again but he said not your dad meaning like 
You're losing oh. your dad, your biggest setback. Oh, I was talking about my work. Yeah. Um, yeah, my personal, of course. Um, you know, I, I loved my father. I still still love him, but uh, he was my role model and hero, and that was enormously hard to lose my father when I was 19. And uh, it's I can talk about it now. I couldn't talk about it for a long time. I was going to ask you if you did, if there's anything you did that coping with that that worked better than, than other things for you. Well, I'll, I'll say that we've, um, what I've learned from it, because I, 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 did, I don't think I coped very well with it because I, I was young and I just shut it out as much as I could um, and didn't talk too much. And, you know, my mom was, so, everybody was suffering. It's, it's not easy. Um, it's, it's awful. Um, but I tried to learn from it and I, we set up this program at, for our, um, in our ALS clinic called Parenting at, at a Challenging Time where we, we have these two um, psychologists who are available to talk to our patients about how to talk to their children about having a serious illness. Because one of the hard things for me was it happened so fast and my father tried to protect us. But he didn't really talk to us too much about being sick. So it was, it was kind of a, a shock. Um, and so I tried to think like, how would, now that I'm an adult, how would it be even better? How can we help our families. And so that's one of the programs we offer that I'm enormously proud of. And that has helped um, our patients, their kids, and, and also the grand grandkids too. What did your father pass of? Well, he had a stomach cancer. Sorry it, it, was, it was very fast, just a couple months. And, uh, you know, I think, think, you know, education was always the most important thing for my family. I, I told you the the no sports thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and so he didn't want any of us to, um, you know, you know, leave school or not do well in school. So he really didn't talk to us too much about it because they really wanted us to stay in college and every, you know, and not, not be affected by it. And that made it harder afterwards because I didn't have my chance to say goodbye the way I would have wanted to. So, um, yeah, that's, so really that's part of you know, what, what we're trying to do with this, this program is, is to help families, because it, it's hard. Families don't know what to do with such serious illnesses. Is there a similar program for patients themselves, or is it really more geared towards kids of the patients or families of the patients? It's for, it's for the patients, but it's to give them the tools to talk to their kids because every, they know their kids best and, and, but it's to, um, and the kids could be young, they could be older, but it, it's really to support the, the person with the ALS and their spouse about how to, how to help their kids. That's something that, um, you know, you don't see online. I mean, when you Google anything, right, it just, it's never, any medical thing on Google is never that reliable. But something that um, hit our family hard with ALS was the, the psychological toll. You never, you never think about that. All you think about is the, physical and the progression and medicines and stuff like that. But that yeah, definitely takes a big toll on, on the mental health too, for, for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we don't take care of the, um, of the, the spouses very much. So that, that is a, another new program that we're building with our department of psychiatry is, is some caregiver support um, for, for, uh, for this illness. That's but a great we, idea. Um, yeah. I think that's a big need. I'm trying to buy you any kind of time I can, Merritt, before he puts you back on the hot seat here. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> How about your last name, C-U-D-K-O-W-I-C-Z? What is the funniest thing anyone has ever called you? I know I had trouble saying it when we first met. Oh, I, <laughs> I've, I've heard every permutation I think you can get. Uh, <laughs> I think the funniest thing was when um, a friend of my husband who's from Poland told me that I mispronounced my own last name. <laughs> And that it's very important how you pronounce it because it either means wonderful or bitch, depending on how you <laughs> pronounce it. And apparently I was pronouncing it not the wonderful way. Which, <laughs> so, which way is the wonderful way? The wonderful way is with the, uh, um, a hard C, Kutkovich. And Sukovich is the not, not so nice way. <laughs> I think... I think when we came to meet you at MGH the first the first time, I think in the same sentence we were saying it two or three different ways. So, I think just our family alone has probably given you every uh, every variation of. Geez, now I feel bad saying Sokovich, but <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I couldn't change it myself. 
And that's a family name, right? Uh, what may I ask is your husband's name? Yeah, no, it's my, uh, yeah, I didn't change my name. It's my father's name. And um, my husband's name is Soritz, uh, which would have been much easier. Uh, but I, I was pretty determined that when I was young, that I was never going to change my name. A little feminist side of me. So. <laughs> I was going to ask where that came from. Yeah. I have to give my parents credit for that. I was always determined to be independent and uh, not change my name, but it would have, it would have made life easier for me. My, my kids do have the shorter sorts last name. Merit, my Christian faith, has had a profound impact on my life. I know you're Jewish. So what, if any, impact has your faith had on your life? It's had a, uh, the biggest impact in um, kind of having a community. I'm, I'm personally not that religious, but we were brought up with all the traditions and obviously going to temple and, um, you know, my, the, the times I've been to Israel, has, it's, it's incredibly moving to see kind of the, the history and to feel a part of, you know, a, a really a longstanding community. Um, and so we obviously, re- we raised our kids uh, Jewish and, um, you know, we feel that kind of connection of the community, less so than, than maybe the religious part of it. And that's something that my father's obviously Christian and my mother's Jewish. That's something that I've always noticed is that uh, there is just a, just a deep sense of community without knowing anything about somebody. Just, you know, when, when Jewish people hear other people are Jewish, they just immediately kind of support them and help uh, in any way they can. So that's, that is definitely a uh, unique, unique factor with Judaism. You are on the Harvard faculty and you're Jewish. What do you think of the recent controversy about the president of Harvard refusing to condemn students who called for the extermination of Jewish people, not only in Israel, but worldwide? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm pretty horrified by it. I'll, I'll just couch that by saying that um, I, I've spent my career at Harvard from, from, from uh, you know, going to medical school there to be on faculty, and it is an amazing place. And I do think it shouldn't be judged by this, this, uh, and that, you know, she doesn't represent, um, a lot of the faculty and their views. Um, I, um, I, I think we have to have a change, you know, it, obviously I don't know everything, but I, I do think leaders of universities need to, to set the example for, you know, moral leadership and, um, um, and while they try to balance free speech, they can't, create places where uh, students don't feel safe. I, um, I recently went, I went on purpose because the medical students, the Jewish medical students at Harvard were feeling not supported and, and uh, a little um, not safe. And so they asked faculty to come together for Shabbat dinner and just have a place where they could speak. And, you know, I went, but the fact that I had to go and that they don't feel secure is just horrifying to me and that i think comes from the leadership and their tolerance of anti-semitism it's just not acceptable so i I do hope that there'll be change um coming do you think that that's a do you think your viewpoint is is the popular one among faculty at harvard or is it split as the you know seems to be in media yeah, no, I think it's split, but I do think that, and I'll say, like, at least the medical school and the and and in our department, people are talking to each other about it, and so I think they're having good dialogues, and which you want at universities, right? You need to be Absolutely. able to speak your mind and talk to each other. So I, um, I don't, I feel that there's like hope there, um, but I think you know people are pretty divided in this country on, on what they think about it. But again, you you need the leaders to be able to support free speech, but not allow hate and, and people to feel um, unsafe in, in their campuses. And that's unfortunately what happened here. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a uh, part of a bigger problem for the whole country. It doesn't seem like you can talk about any, any issues anymore. It's, everything's very polarized and everyone gets shouted, shouted down. So uh, I think it's, this is more publicized and, and uh, because of the Harvard brand and, and association, probably a little more scrutinized, but um, it's, it's a problem and a lot more than just this one issue. Yeah. We have, you know, we have a, a big uh, neurology residency program. We have 19 residents each year 
and we have people from all faiths there. And we're we're really doing what we can do in our local uh, level to make sure that there's good dialogue and everybody feels safe. So I do feel good about that. I do think that, um, you know, uh, people who lead, whether you're the president of the university or, or, you know, a president of a department, that you can set an example of how to have dialogue and how to support people and, not, and make sure people aren't threatened. Um, and so I, I feel in our own way, we can keep doing it. And hopefully, again, um, this will translate into the, the leaders of the university also doing the same. I agree. And we love Harvard. Our daughter, Tate, went to Harvard. Yeah. Yes, it's, a, it's an amazing place. And we want to keep it that way. And remember that I've, I've never left because, you know, you can do anything really here. Like, you know, you, there's brilliant people, there's resources, um, there's an openness to innovation, and um, it, it, it's, it's just a fabulous place. So um, we want to keep attracting great students and, and great faculty. Do you think there will be any, any blowback from students or faculty leaving or not wanting to come to Harvard because of this? I worry about that. I, I know they've already reported on, on fewer applications, but you know, it's hard to know if the reasons for that. Um, but I do think that if it's not resolved soon or doesn't improve soon, it will, it will have lasting impacts uh, on both faculty and students. Have you spent any time at even a whimsical moment thinking about what's next after you help cure ALS? Yeah, I used to, um, I used to say I would retire when, when I, I cured ALS, and then I switched that I could just go to another area whether it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, um, you know, I, I really love what I do. I, and I know, I know uh, that's another one of our common things. You've always loved what you do. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of neurology that still needs to be discovered. So I'll switch to another illness. That's awesome. Uh, Merritt, if, uh, if people wanted to learn more about, you know, you and, and what you're doing and, and at MGH and uh, the plat master platform trial, where should they go? There's uh, two good places. One is our, our website. You, uh, people can Google the, the Healy Center for ALS at MGH. Um, but there's also a great uh, website called uh, Tackle ALS. And that's uh, what we're working on together to raise funds to um, focus on research around this repair and regeneration. How do we give people back uh, function um, and strength? Um, so bo both uh, websites uh, would be fantastic for more information. Giving, giving our website, you must have got the $5 I sent you. So <laughs> giving our website, you must have got the $5 I sent you in the mail to bring that up. So that's perfect. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to ask you. So you, you've obviously, you know, one of the things that we want to do on this podcast just have interesting conversations with interesting people. We don't want it to be um, just an ALS podcast or a disability podcast or, or an athlete's podcast. So a question I have for you, who is somebody you know that has a really interesting story that you, know, you think people would like to hear? Um, there's like there's so many. I, I'm just going to say, um, Rochelle, uh, if we can get her, Rochelle Walensky. Um, she uh, was the head of the CDC. She used to uh, be at Mass General as our head of infectious disease, and um, I know her personally. She's an amazing woman and leader, and has had an interesting life. That's one idea. Um, That's uh, awesome. That's a good one. And and Merit, last thing I gotta we we've got to say if people wanted to support ALS, what's what are the best things they could do? Um, whether it's you know if they have if they have money and also if they don't have money, what what's the best thing they could do for for supporting the disease? I think for people who want to um, donate philanthropically, I think um, and I'm a little biased, but I think the Tackle ALS um, uh, team is is fantastic, and uh, you can donate right on the website there and. That, that is now going for repair and regeneration. I, I think um, there are many other ways to help. Um, and, and for example, there are organizations that um, will um, help help people living with the, the illness. Uh, one of them is ALS One. Another one is Compassionate Care ALS. And you can donate time there or, um, you know, to help out a family. Sometimes it's doing some chores for people or 
or building, you know, a ramp for somebody, there's ways to donate your time um, and, and maybe skill sets. That's uh, awesome. People living with ALS. People should know that Tackle ALS is not a foundation. Yeah, so Tackle ALS, just, just to clarify, it's not a foundation. It's just a kind of a flashy billboard. So if people go on to TackleALS.com and donate, you'll get a receipt directly from Mass General Hospital. Um, one of the reasons we set it up is we didn't want to have, to have any percentage go to admin fees or anything like that. We wanted it all to go directly um, to Mara and her team to, to come up with, at the time, uh, groundbreaking research and, and drugs, which was about slowing things down. And now it's about repair and generation. Thank you so much, Merritt. For all you do for me and everyone suffering from ALS, we love you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for your friendship and, and letting me into your amazing family. Um, so part of, part of all of you guys. And Merritt, thank you so much. It was really fun talking as always. And I always leave a little bit smarter. So I, maybe I'll go take the SAT again. <laughs> thanks so much this episode is brought to you in part by the sean m healy and amg center for als at massachusetts general hospital a proud supporter of tim green barkley damon llp is proud to be the law firm sponsor of tim green's podcast nothing left unsaid for more on barkley damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarclayDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.